started good af good afternoon or good morning or good evening or good whatever time zone you're based in my name is rob saguero gomez and i am an associate professor in ecology at the department of zoology of, of oxford and together with my colleague hannah austin uh we have been organizing this series of seminars uh pseudo monthly on topics related on the mechanisms and the phenomena that led us to live longer and better before I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Dr. David Gold, I would like to highlight ARCH. ARCH, or the Aging Research Collaborative Hub, is an online platform that highlights some of the very exciting research related to aging and how to live longer and better across the four different divisions of the University of Oxford. It also highlights research by our industrial partners, colleagues in the UK and other universities overseas. Now, some very general rules of engagement, as you already probably know by now, our speaker today, Dr. Gold, will be sharing with us his research for about 30 minutes. And during that time, I'll ask that you please mute yourself. You're welcome to leave your camera on if you would like to provide your beautiful face to him so that he has got an active audience, but you don't have to feel forced to that if your bandwidth is such that that wouldn't be conducive. I'd ask you to please feel free to post your questions on the chat channel that can be found on the top right. There should be a chat option for you to post in your questions, which will then be addressed in the second half of the presentation where we give our speaker a Q&A session. Just obviously to highlight this presentation has been recorded in an effort to be able to make it available to other attendees who given our current time zone would otherwise not be able to join us or who given the football right now going on here in the UK might be watching the, the pre-dialogue about the England Germany football team. I think it is happening in one hour. To all of you who are here, by the way, thank you so much for making the time. Um, today, I've got the great, great pleasure of introducing somebody whose research I've been really intrigued by and finally get the chance to, to hear speaking um, in, 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 in live, um, Dr. David Gold. Dr. David Gold is a, an assistant professor in geobiology at UC Davis, a position that he gained in 2018 and where he has been based since. He um, is an evolutionary, he studies the evolutionary history of animals. He did his bachelor's at UC Irvine. Then he moved within the same states to UCLA to do a PhD in biology on sequencing and annotation of the first jellyfish genome. After that, he did a couple of postdocs, one at MIT, the other one at Caltech where he applied genomics to the origin of biosignatures preserved in billion year old rocks and uh, to study how jellyfish re regenerates missing tissue, which is a really interesting topic on the theme of how to live longer. Today, Dr. Gold will be talking to us about how to break the rules of aging, lessons from jellyfish and other ancient animals. David, thank you so much for joining us virtually today. And we wish we had you here in person so that we could also uh, have you in the 3D, but we will limit ourselves to, to having you in 2D. In Thank you so much. At this point, I will stop sharing my screen and ask you, David, if you could please share yours. All right, and you can hear me and see the slides just fine? Yes. Rob? Wonderful. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rob, for the kind introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I didn't realize I was competing with football, so <laughs> thank you for showing up. Um, yeah, so my talk today, let me just make sure the apologies, let me just get the, well, that'll be fine. All right, so my talk today is Breaking the Rules of Aging, Lessons from Jellyfish and Other Ancient Animals. Um, as Rob mentioned, I, I'm a geobiologist here at UC Davis, and you might be wondering why is a geobiologist like myself interested in aging? You know, um, and as I said, my, my interests are, are really broad. You know, I, I'm interested in questions that bring the fossil record and the genetic record together. So I've been starting to look at, say, how animals build shells, the production of different geochemical biomarkers, 
And as I'll talk a lot about today, I do a lot of research with jellyfish. Um, all this work is kind of brought together because I think about questions of biology at, at long time scales. You know, so I ask how things change over millions and often hundreds of millions of years with a real focus on ancient animals. And I'll explain what I mean by ancient animals in just a few minutes. Um, but right, the, the rise of animals, their origin and early diversification is fundamentally a story about the origins and diversification of multicellularity, how we went from our single-celled ancestors and relatives to the diversity we see today. And aging in animals is just, it's a fundamentally different process in many ways than aging if you are a single cell line or a, or a bacterium or even a yeast, right? So multicellularity brings in new questions about aging. And as we'll see, a lot of these ancient animals, some of the earliest groups of animals to evolve, really defy a lot of our expectations of how aging and longevity works. And so this is what's gotten me so interested in the subject. And, and this talk is going to be about introducing some really amazing animals to you, right? There's all these emerging model organisms out there that exhibit remarkable life histories and have become you know, organisms of study for longevity research. For example, scientists have gotten really interested in, in large mammals like humpback whales and elephants. Right? These are creatures that live for a very long time and just given their size and the number of cells that they have in their body, they should be getting cancer at much higher rates than they appear to do. So there's been research on them. A lot of scientists have been studying naked mole rats, you know, which live in order of magnitude longer than their closest relatives. Um, they live underground. They can deal with oxygen at much lower levels than their relatives. And, and they seem pretty much impervious to cancer. You know, and then again, I'll be talking about things like moon jellyfish and sponges and, and how they you know, break a lot of the rules that we you know, think are fundamental to animal aging processes. And of course, there are some people who study naked mole rats because they are just passionate about naked mole rats. I, I know a couple of those people, right? But most of us, when we do this comparative work, our fundamental goal is to look at these different species and find some sort of basic biological processes that in turn can tell us something about aging in humans and right? tell us something about ourselves. So that's how we, our goal in comparative biology research. And unfortunately, it, it, from my experience, I feel like it leads some scientists to, to really try to interpret their data when they're looking at model organisms um, through this sort of, take it philosophically, this typological thinking. You know, they see that there's a certain gene or, you know, or a gene pathway that plays an important role in longevity in a mouse or a fruit fly or a yeast. And then the hope is that that, that gene plays a fundamental role. It is a regulator of aging. Right? And so, and that 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 you know, same gene will, will regulate aging in other animals, including ourselves. You know, but I'm trained as an evolutionary biologist, and evolutionary biologists recognize that even the most basic biological processes, cell-cell signaling or you know, senescence and aging, right, these processes are constantly being tinkered with. Certain genes and processes are lost over time. They're repurposed from one original function to another. Different lineages converge upon the same solution. Right? So to really do comparative work and to make sense of it, it, it really, you, you get a lot of new insights and I think a better interpretation of the data if you can do it within an evolutionary framework. So as I said, today I'm gonna to be talking about what I'm calling ancient animals. Um, <laughs> and. It, it, for an evolutionary biologist um, to talk about any living organism as ancient is controversial. Uh, even got in a debate practicing this talk with my, my laboratory about whether or not I should use this term, but it was in my title, so I'm in too deep, but I'll try to justify it. Um, but I really do wanna reinforce this point, right? We really should be cautious when looking at living things today and making assumptions about what is ancient and what is not, right? All living things share a common ancestor and they've all had equal time to evolve. Right? So being, for example, physically or morphologically simple does not mean that you're ancient. I'm gonna provide an example here that'll be relevant to the talk, right? Um, mammals, uh, insects, nematode worms, flatworms, these animals that are commonly um, used in aging research, right? They're all, they all share a common ancestor. They're all part of one big clade of animals called the bilateria. They're called the bilateria because these are animals that at least at some point in their development display 
bilateral symmetry. They have a left and a right side. And so flatworms are very simple when you compare them to a mammal, um, but they're all bilaterians. They've all been evolving for the same amount of time, a little over half a billion years. And when you go back to the fossil record um, and try to find those earliest representatives of the bilateria, um, potentially including organisms like this fossil of Dickinsonia here, uh, you see it doesn't really look much like any of the living lineages. And so remember, each lineage has had its own complex history of gains and losses and complexity. So all of that being said, we really don't generally like to talk about living things as ancient. Um, I decided to use that term for a few reasons with the organisms I'm going to be talking about today. I'll primarily be focusing on members of the Cnidaria. These are animals that possess stinging cells. So things like jellyfish, corals, sea anemones, hydras. To a lesser extent, I'll talk a bit also about sea sponges. And so these are some of the simplest animals that they lack uh, any kind of symmetry at all. And these animals I think are interesting for a couple reasons. First, they branch off of the evolutionary tree of animal life real early, right? So these are some of the few groups living today that are not part of the bilateria. You know, 99% of all living animals today are bilateria, but these groups broke off first. And when we do find them in the fossil record, um, for example, here is a fossil of a sponge of oxia from about 500 million years ago. You can see like physically they've changed um, very little, right? So I, I wanna be cautious about that. That doesn't mean that they haven't changed in other important ways genetically or when it comes to cellular processes. And we'll talk about some of those uh, today, but it does, I think that there's this stasis, there's this physical stasis that these forms have been around for hundreds of millions of years. They branched off early. And as best as we can tell from the fossil record, they have not changed a whole lot, at least in their basic form. And for that, I, I, I do wanna distinguish those kinds of animals from other groups. and so. For the purposes of today, I'm going to call them ancient animals. And these ancient animals, between these cnidarians and these sea sponges, they really have some remarkable capabilities when it comes to longevity and aging. But first of all, most of these animals at some point in their life cycle can reproduce asexually, right? So they can clone themselves, producing buds. For example, here on the left, this is a sea anemone undergoing fission, right? Which means that it's literally just kind of pulling itself in two different directions. <laughs> until it rips in half and ends up being two clones of the original organism. Um, and those creatures, again, when particularly when they're going through these asexual cycles, usually have extremely long uh, lifespans and, and many of them don't show any clear evidence of senescence or aging at all when they do this. Um, in a related note, this here is a, a polyp and a medusa from the jellyfish Turritopsis. Uh, many of you might have heard of this as the immortal jellyfish. And so the medusa, which normally is short-lived, if it undergoes stress or is damaged, it can reverse its life cycle, go back to being a polyp, and these polyps can then asexually reproduce and eventually make more medusas. Right? So it never has necessarily an end to its life cycle. And then the longest living animals that we know of come from things like sea sponges. This is a deep sea sponge, an image of one called monorhaphis. And it produces this one long skeletal element. Here right in the uh, right-hand corner is a researcher. She's holding one of those spicules, this skeletal element. You can see how long it is. Um, and because it grows through accretion, you can look at, study the skeletal element and see how old the sponge was when that skeletal element was collected. And I think this one was dated at about 11,000 years old. And so again, these animals just, many of them have remarkable longevity. They don't necessarily have an end to their life cycle the way most bilaterian animals do. And that makes them so exciting for regeneration and aging research. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to provide you two examples of my work where I'm trying to use ancient animals and this comparative evolutionary framework to gain greater insight into, uh, you know, how aging is regulated in different animals and how we should do comparative biology work. And I like these two examples in part because this is what I'm working on, but <laughs> I think they touch on different levels of biological hierarchy, which is nice, right? So whether you're interested in the physical form of organisms or you're interested in cell types, and I'll be talking about stem cells and their role in pluripotency, or whether you're interested in the genes underlying aging, such as I'll be talking today about sirtuin genes, um, you still see that this comparative evolutionary framework and particularly integrating these ancient animals 
gives us new insights. Okay. So I'm going to start by talking about stem cells. Uh, and if you want to think about stem cells and their role in aging, particularly when it comes to these ancient animals, probably the good place to start is with hydra. Hydra is sort of the emerging model organism when it comes to aging research within this group. So here is an image of a hydra. They're very small animals. Um, and there's many different species, but particularly the strains that are most common in laboratories uh, around the, certainly around the country in the United States. You know, these are an asexual strain, so they produce by budding. Here you can see this one polyp, there's the mouth and the tentacles, and here it's producing a bud or a new polyp. Um, and this strain of hydra that's asexual shows no sign of aging. Right? So normally a, a tiny invertebrate like this, you, these things usually live, what if it's a bilaterian, it lives weeks, maybe months or a year. You know, but with hydra, there have been scientists who have been raising single polyps, they cut off and remove any buds that are being produced. And they've grown individual hydro polyps at this point for over 20 years now without any evidence that the animal is running out of steam or can no longer produce buds. You know, and, and the way that hydra does this, there's been a lot of research to try to study it, is that it's constantly producing new cells. So it has this um, lots of stem cells lining the body that are constantly going off making new cells and that produces new buds or that they just get rid of the old cells. So there's always proliferation always turn over in the cells. And that seems to be an important part, a critical part of its longevity. And people have been working on the genetics of it. It turns out that many of the genes that are implicated in stem cell maintenance and longevity in Hydra, particularly the FOXO uh, transcription factor, uh, have really been demonstrated to be, you know, sometimes it's termed like a master regulator of stem cell maintenance, right? That this particular gene, when you turn it off or mess with it, it, it messes with, the production of stem cells and ultimately leads to hydra um, demonstrating an aging curve, right, where the animal senesces or undergoes biological aging. So, you know, again, real exciting model system. And I've been kind of complementing this ongoing work with, with my favorite study system, the moon jellyfish. So I like moon jellyfish, um, besides the fact they're just really beautiful to watch in an aquarium. Uh, they also have a really interesting life cycle. So to, it's kind of a really compl complicated life cycle too. So to let me walk through it quickly, you, know, you start with the medusa, right? That's what you typically see when you think of a jellyfish. These uh, life stages are sexual. So the males and the females produce larvae and then the larvae go on to become polyps. And so the polyp of a moon jellyfish is very similar to the polyp of a hydra, right? It can asexually reproduce, it can clone itself. Um, I've had, I have personally have colonies of moon jellyfish that are produced from one polyp where I've let it asexually grow into a whole colony. I've not followed one individual polyp yet in my research, but you know, I have colonies generated from one individual that are going strong 15 years later at this point. So again, no clear evidence of senescence or aging in these animals. They then go through a second form of asexual reproduction called strobilation, where the polyp, I'll just let that go a little longer, where the polyp um, basically lengthens, lengthens out, divides up into a lot of little segments, and each segment turns into a small medusa that pops off, swims away, and eventually grows into a, and again, a new medusa, right? So there's essentially two different adult forms of the moon jellyfish. There's the medusa stage and the polyp stage. The polyp, asexual, no evidence of aging. The medusa, um, much more like a, you know, a bilaterian animals. It, um, sexual reproduction, lives for a year in the wild, maybe a couple years in the aquarium. And after that, you see the senescence process begin. It develops holes in the bell. Uh, it grows extra stomachs and the stomachs become malformed and eventually it just kind of ages and dies. And so I've been really interested in trying to understand what changes, what's different genetically between these two parts of the life stage. Um, and what might that tell us about going from one type of life history trait to another? So there we go. And so one of the things you do when you're doing this comparative biology and you want an evolutionary framework is you want to look at some of the closer relatives and try to understand the patterns that we're seeing. So one of the things I was curious about is, is how does the Aurelia polyp compare to the Hydra polyp, which is better understood? And as I mentioned, right, the, the Hydra polyp undergoes continual and constant cell proliferation. 
So if you were to hit it with something like a BRDU or EDU, one of these stains that marks dividing cells, you'll see that there's this, you know, basically the whole body column of the hydra lights up with the, you, know, the, you can see and so most of these cells that are lighting up in the hydra are stem cells that are constantly dividing. And this is a full sized adult hydra polyp, right? So even though it's not getting any bigger, cells are constantly dividing. And if you take a full size, you know, quote unquote, adult Aurelia polyp, you'll see the same thing, right? So here, a blue is just staining all the nuclei in this particular polyp, and then the green are the dividing cells. And again, you see the same thing where there's dividing cells all throughout the body column. Actually, you even see dividing cells in the tentacles of Aurelia, which is something that you don't see in Hydra, but um, is consistent with previous studies, some old studies that have shown that you can regenerate an Aurelia polyp from the tentacles, which is not true of Hydra. So that supports the idea that what's going on, that these cells that are dividing are also playing a role like the stem cells in Hydra. But interestingly, if you go and you do things like transmission electron microscopy or you know, those similar techniques, and you try to actually look for stem cells in Aurelia, uh, you don't find them. You know, there's nothing that has this like basic stem cell morphology. If you look at Hydra and its relatives, I actually think this particular picture is from a, a relative of Hydra called um, Clidia. You, know, you can see these are these nice, these are clearly defined um, interstitial stem cells of this lineage, right? So they're stem cells, they're undifferentiated, they've got a large nucleus. And this is normally what we think of as a stem cell, the cell that's not playing any particular function, it's set aside to make new cell types. But we just can't find anything like that in Aurelia. And this got me thinking, you know, I started doing this work as, uh, in 2013 originally as part of a review paper. And I was looking at all the different cell types of different cnidarians. And it turned out that really most jellyfish, sea anemones, corals, they don't have that nice, uh, clearly distinguishable stem cell line. And this raises the question for me, you know, could stem cells have evolved multiple times? Right here, I've got a phylogeny, right, or an evolutionary tree. Here I've got those bilaterians up at the top and I've broken apart the cnidarians a bit more so you can see the different groups of sea anemones and corals and jellyfish. And what I found is that all the lineages that have a clear stem cell line are all part of one group called the hydrozoa, right? So there's sort of one, only one small derived, well, I mean, it's a pretty big group actually, but still it's one group within the larger clade of cnidarians and only one of them have these nice interstitial stem cells. So my hypothesis, you know, going in was that there could be that, that the idea that committed cell types and bilaterians, right? We have the stem cell lines and they become more and more committed as they turn into new cell types. And they be, it becomes more difficult for those cells as they become more committed to turn into new types of cells. And perhaps that's just not true in a lot of ancient animals. They might have more flexibility in what cell becomes another kind of cell, right? Te the technical term for that is trans differentiation. And trans differentiation might be more common um, for these animals. And then in the hydrozoa, this is eventually evolved into a new stem cell line. So to try to test that idea, um, I've been looking at single cell sequencing as a way to try to further look at this. So single cell sequencing is a way to look at the genes expressed in every cell. You basically take an organism or a tissue, you disassociate all the cells, and then you read off all of the DNA, or sorry, all the RNA right, all the genes that are expressed in every cell. And then you group them together based on their expression profiles. So for example, this figure right here from a, my colleague, uh, Selena Giuliano here at UC Davis, she took a hydra, right? So this is a hydra, a whole individual. You take all the cells, separate them, sequence all the RNA, all the genes in each cell. And each one of these dots represents one cell that was sequenced from the hydra polyp. Right? And so then based on their similarity, they get clustered together into groups. You know, the coloring here represents hypothetical cell types. And then right, the similarity of different groups of cell types to each other um, has the potential to represent the trajectory, how one cell turns into another. So remember, this is just like one snapshot in time, right? But the relationship of cell types to each other suggests developmental trajectory. So I kind of give you a good example of one relevant to my work. You focus in here, here you've got this cluster of cells that based on the markers in them are hypothesized to be this one of the stem cell lines. And you can see it going sort of two different directions. Um, in one direction, it's becoming these 
neuron gland cells and then eventually the progenitor to the neuron cells or the you know, uh, nervous system cells. And then eventually around it, surround it, we see the different um, uh, neurons that are being produced, right? So the idea is here we can actually see at an RNA-seq level, at the level of gene expression, one cell type, these stem cells turning into neurons. And similarly, there's this other trajectory um, where the same stem cell line turns into what are called NB or neuroblasts. These are the progenitor cells for the stinging cells of Hydra. Right? So we can see the stem cell line kind of going in two different directions, becoming either stinging cells or pre-coming neuroprogenitor cells. And so to show you some really fresh preliminary data. <laughs> this will probably turn out to be wrong, but I think it's really interesting and intriguing so for this talk, um, is that, uh, you know, so we're starting to do this work in the Aurelia polyp, right, for comparison. And we're finding these interesting clusters that show a similar general pattern, where I've got these stem cell, or I shouldn't say stem cell, we've got these cell lines, right, that um, sort of in one direction, we can see them morph into probable Putative nidocytes are stinging cells. They contain things like the venom proteins that are specific to the stinging cell. We can see them go in another trajectory where one of the big markers that comes out is this POW4F3. Um, this gene is also, this transcription factor is also known as BRAIN3. It's been shown to be specific to the nervous system of moon jellyfish, right? So we can see kind of like these different then uh, more advanced nervous neuron cells over here. And one of the things that I found intriguing is that FOXO, right, that master regulator of stem cell pluripotency in Hydra, is definitely found in those kind of um, cells that intermingle, right? And so in Hydra, FOXO is specific to the stem cell line. But here I'm finding FOXO actually, you know, it's in a lot of these progenitor cell types. You don't find it in the final stinging cells. You don't find it in the final, you know, mature neurons, but all these progenitor their lines that are kind of on their way to becoming a stinging cell or becoming a neuron also contain this FOXO transcript. So again, this is very preliminary work that I'm sharing with you, but it, I think it's intriguing and supports the possibility that perhaps as these, you know, that basically just the different cell lines of Aurelia, probably these epithelial cells, you know, that also play a role in musculature and digestion, just maintain more potency and are capable of turning into different cell types at more points, they have greater flexibility. So kind of the takeaway from this case study is that cell differentiation is just less strict in many ancient animals. And the production of a master stem cell line likely evolved multiple times, if I'm right, if, if my interpretation of the evolutionary perspective is right. And so these similarities that we see between the stem cells of Hydra and the stem cells of humans, if my interpretation is right, this is probably more about constraints on how you make a stem cell as a biological system, as opposed to the stem cell of Hydra and the stem cell of humans actually having a common ancestor, right? That there was some ancestral stem cell that both lineages use and modify. So that fundamentally changes how we interpret the data when we're doing comparative biology. So I wanna give you one more shorter case study, uh, just because this is a, another area I've started exploring over the last year. Uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with sirtuin genes. Those who are interested in aging, are, are, you know, sirtuins are very exciting, um, particularly SIR2, uh, which is involved in NAD hydrolysis. This here is a reconstruction I made of the SIR2 protein in yeast, where it was first discovered. And it it's, has a very strong connection to longevity in yeast, and it's been found to play a role in longevity in other animals as well, particularly because it seems to play a critical role in modulating uh, the relationship between metabolism, cell cycle, and aging, right? So a lot of you are probably familiar with the idea that uh, you know, a low calorie diet can increase lifespan. And SIR2 seems to be an important protein modulating that relationship. Um, there's seven clades or groups of sirtuins that are formally recognized. And this is primarily based on studies of mammals that discuss these different sirtuin genes, but really only a small number of animals have been studied. And there's really very little information on those first animals, the ancient animals, how many sirtuins do they have? Um, so I started this collaboration with David Sinclair. Um, a lot of you might know him. He's a longevity researcher at Harvard Medical. And we, been interested in sirtuins and jellyfish. And we wanted to just start by asking, well, what does the evolutionary history of sirtuins look like? And do we get a better perspective if we take an evolutionary approach 
and include a lot of ancient animals. Um, and one of the things that I discovered you know, in this work, again, this is uh, unpublished work that hopefully will be putting out at least in preprint very soon. Um, but what we see here is that we've got, you know, we're able to recover the primary sirtuins uh, that have been described before, but we also, when we, this, oh, just to clarify, right, so this right here is a phylogeny or an evolutionary tree of sirtuin genes, right, so we looked at lots and lots of different animals, we looked at some close relatives of animals and fungi, and tried to just cluster and figure out how the sirtuin genes themselves are related to each other, and these different colors represent major clades of sirtuins, we could recover the traditional clades, but we also found two at least two clades of sirtuins that have not been recognized before. Part of this larger class four uh, clade of sirtuins, and they're closely related to this one sirtuin called sir six or sirtuin six, which has also been implicated in longevity. Uh, it's been shown, there was a nature paper a while back where how it regulates lifespan in mice, for example. So there's these sirtuins related to longevity that have not been described before because no one was looking at enough of these ancient animals. Um, this is a pretty complicated figure right here, so let me take a second to break it down. So here on the left, I've got a phylogeny, right, an evolutionary tree of all the organisms we analyze for this data set. Um, the animals are highlighted in this blue box. Right? So you know, we can see these are all relatives of animals, including some fungi and other single-celled creatures. Um, and then each one of these columns represents one group of sirtuins. And the main thing I want to note here is there's this one sirtuin called, we're calling it right now, sir 4 c uh, It was a little hard to place its relationship exactly to the other sirtuins other than it's part of this larger clade. You know, it's really common in sea sponges. We can find it in sea sponges. We can even find it in some of the single cell ancestors of animals, but then it's mostly been lost in other animals um, with maybe an exception in this one worm that we need to explore. Similarly, we see that the, you know, what we think of as sirtuin 6 actually at the dawn of animal life, when the first animals originated, there seems to have been a duplication event, that they, all of a sudden there were two copies of sirtuin 6. But if you look at the bilaterian animals down here, they've lost one of those two copies, right? So there's this second copy that's common in sea sponges, that's common in some cnidarians, uh, but we just don't see it in the uh, quote unquote higher animals, you know, or the bilaterian animals. And so, you know, if you were to take a real traditional view of sirtuins um, and you just did your model organisms, you looked at yeast up here, you looked at uh, nematode worms, you looked at fruit flies, you looked at mammals, you would get this impression that the number of sirtuins have been increasing over evolutionary time, right? That yeast have three sirtuins, uh, C. elegans, the nematode worm has three sirtuins, Drosa or, sorry, I guess it's got four, but it's got three classes of sirtuins, three major types. Drosophila has got five major types and then uh, humans have seven, right? So it looks like the numbers are increasing. But when you take this broader evolutionary view, I mean, particularly include a lot of early branching animals, you'll see that it's actually quite the opposite, that there were more sirtuins early in animal evolution and different lineages have lost lots of them. And so again, right, the sponges have all these different sirtuins and you'll notice that not every sponge has every sirtuin. So even just looking at one sponge would give you a false view of the early evolution of animal life. Um, you know, you need to look at many of them to get this perspective of what the first animals had. And then just to note down here with this blue bar, right? So the jellyfish are one of these groups that have both of these sirtuins of the sirtuin six copies, right? So again, if you were to just look at your classic model organisms, you would never know that there were two copies. But when you look at things like jellyfish, you see there are two. And so again, all preliminary work, but I just thought for this talk, you know, we see there's these different sirtuins and I've been talking a lot about moon jellyfish. So to take it back to them, I'm thinking, well, how are these sirtuins expressed? Back when I did the genome of this animal, um, I collected data looking at how gene expression changes through the life cycle. So I collected RNA from little uh, larvae, looking at the polyp and then going through that metamorphosis into becoming an adult medusa. And this right here is a heat map um, showing you gene expression profiles. So the more yellow uh, square is, that means the gene is upregulated at a particular life stage. And the more purple it is, that means it's going down in relative abundance. Um, and then each row here represents a single sirtuin, right? So you can see, for example, with sirtuin two, 
um, the one that's known to do aging in yeast, you know, its highest, its highest expression level is in the polyp stage. And then it goes progressively down when you get to those Medusa stages. And actually with all the sirtuins, including these new ones that have not been described before, we get this actual same general pattern, which is pretty intriguing to me that, that almost all this, well, all the sirtuins um, are highly expressed in the polyp and almost all of them go down in expression as you turn into a Medusa, which really I think implicates sirtuins as playing an important role in the longevity of the polyp of the moon jellyfish. So to conclude my talk, right? So I've given you some different examples, talking about FOXO transcription factor, talking about sirtuins, and a lot of these things, we study them in a model system. It looks really intriguing, right? As a master regulator, maybe this is the key to studying aging. And, and maybe those things will pan out to be true, but I think we're gonna have a much better time. We're gonna do a better job finding these regulators. If we take an evolutionary perspective, Right? We use an evolutionary framework to refine our ideas and our hypotheses, and that these ancient animals, the sea anemones, the hydras, the jellyfish and sponges, they're a really underexplored resource for doing this kind of work to understand how evolution, you know, they're, they're just very amazing animals with unique life histories. And if we can integrate them into our studies, I think we'll have a much clearer understanding about how longevity evolved and has changed across animal lineages over time. So thank you. I want to thank my lab and uh, all my funding sources. Um, I think I'm a few minutes over, so I'll just leave it there. And I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. That was a so exciting presentation, extremely well delivered on an equally fascinating topic. Uh, I think that I can see quite a few people doing virtual hand claps. So thank you so much for that. We're now going to, of course, switch on to the second and final part of this presentation, which is the Q&A. So I now open the virtual stage for questions. Folks with questions are very welcome to unmute themselves and uh, pose the question directly to Dr. Gold. We've got the first question actually is in the chat channel. So David, if that's okay, I will read it out loud for you, okay? Yes. So Carolina asks, is number of sirtuins linked to asexual reproduction on ancient animals, i.g. Medusa, polyps? That's, that's a wonderful question. Uh, and honestly, you know, so we're just starting to explore the significance of these patterns. And I think one thing to be definitely clear on is there's definitely no clear link between the number of sirtuins you have and your longevity, right? So it's not as simple as that. I know there's been some work, for example, on like tumor suppressant genes in whales and elephants, uh, where they have more copies of the genes than we do, and that probably plays a role in their ability to fight off cancers. Um, so there's nothing clean like that. You know, we actually added a lot of whales and elephants and different mammals to this study to see if we could find anything. And then there's no pattern like that. Um, so there certainly are animals in this group. Um, for example, over here in my phylogeny or my evolutionary tree is a bunch of sea anemones. You know, a lot of these sea anemones have lost one of those two POW6 genes, but they're certainly capable of asexual reproduction. Um, so I think the short answer is, is we really you know, we know that there are these, there are more genes out there, more sirtuins than we recognize um, that probably are playing important roles, but we don't know precisely what those roles are yet. And I think that would be the exciting, it's a great question. The exciting next step would be to really dig in, study what do those sirtuins do in a moon jellyfish? What do they do in a hydra? Ideally, I would love to look at like sea anemones like nematostella that are becoming model systems as well. And again, if you, that's why you can't really, it's, it's difficult, but you can't just look at one model organism to get the full perspective. You need to look at multiple organisms and try to reconstruct that history. So in short, it's a long way of saying we don't know yet, but um, I think it'll be very exciting to see in the future where that goes. Thank you so much for that, David. Very clear answer as well. Um, Again, I welcome folks to either write down your questions in the chat channel or to unmute yourself and ask the question directly.
Oh, there's another one coming through in the chat channel. I will read it out loud for you again, David, as well. So where do sirtuins seem to have started? Are they bacteria, archaea, plants? Yes, another wonderful question, right? Because uh, this goes back to uh, David Sinclair's work on sirtuins. Um, if I can recall right, because I'm not a uh, um, I'm learning about the whole tree of life, but generally my expertise has been on the animals. If I recall correctly, there are sirtuins in bacteria, you know, as well as eukaryotes. It's, it's found across almost all eukaryotes. Um, I've noticed there, in my analyses, looking at genomes that are publicly available, there definitely are some eukaryotes, you know, some, some unusual organisms that seem to lack sirtuins at all, which I think is also, again, that evolutionary perspective is particularly interesting and it'd be fun to get a hold of some of those organisms and study them. Because again, if you were to take um, uh, David Sinclair's perspective on this work, uh, you know, he really thinks of sirtuins as being fundamental to the aging process. So clearly at least some organisms have figured out how to get by without them. But they're very, very ancient. Um, they are in bacteria. I don't recall, I wanna say that they're, I don't recall if they're in archaea. You know, I'd have to go do a look on that. But but again, the thought is these are, you know, part of what makes sirtuins intriguing is they're extremely ancient. They could be as ancient as, as life itself, you know, as cellular life. Um, and it seems to play a, a, you know, a lot of these sirtuins play very similar roles in regulating and modulating when cells decide to divide and grow um, and take on that risk of, you know, replication and DNA damage that eventually is, is so critical to aging. Um, versus other, you know, when it's going to kind of focus more on metabolism, stasis, you know, growing and, and repairing itself. And so that's why they seem to be so intriguing as candidates driving a lot of our aging processes. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, that question, by the way, was by Nate Wilcox. Uh, we've got another question by Aaron Sepil. Aaron, feel free to unmute yourself if you would like. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you. That was really nice talk. Uh, my question was that do you have the single cell data also for the medusas and do you find or do you expect to find foxo in different clusters if you have it for the medusas themselves that, that that is a great question thank you for it um and it's certainly something i would like to do right one of the issues um, of comparative biology is right each organism has its pros and cons right and there's a reason why so many people work on fruit flies and nematode worms because when you have a whole community working on one organism, it's easy to develop protocols um, to raise them. And some animals are easier in the lab than others. You know, the Aurelia polyp is very easy, very easy to raise in the lab. You could do it at home. I, I've messed with them and accidentally, you know, the water's broken out of their tanks and they just cover themselves in the mucus overnight. They've been fine. I've doubled the salinity, half the salinity. They're, 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 they're hardy critters and they're very small. So it's easy to do laboratory work and separate the cells. You know, a medusa, a full grown Aurelia medusa can reach you know, over a foot in diameter, right? So they get real big. And so you couldn't really take the whole organism and do a single cell seek on the whole the whole animal. You could perhaps, in, we could, and I'm interested in taking tissue samples and perhaps looking, right? So it's always gonna be a little trickier to be certain, you know, have you really captured all the cell types in a big Medusa jellyfish? Um, I think my goal going forward is our hope is that we can identify this cryptic stem cell line. I don't know if FOXO is gonna end up being an important molecular marker. You know, it is in Hydra, so that's intriguing now, but the idea is to try to use the polyp to find whatever cell type is the progenitor to the downstream cells, the nervous system cells, the stinging cells. And then probably once we have those markers, then we can go and probably instead of using a single cell seek approach in the Medusa, I'd like to then use those markers to try to light up the animal and figure out which if any cells in the Medusa have those abilities. But it is really intriguing when you look at like, um, you know, so we don't know a lot about the cell types at least at a genetic level within a Medusa jellyfish for the moon jellyfish. Um, but I think there's intriguing evidence that, that they probably, this potency does wear out as they get older. Um, besides the fact that we see that aging or senescence process happen 
and in very old medusas that are raised in aquariums. Um, we also notice if you just study regenerative capabilities, right? The very early stage when you get those uh, medusas right away, when they develop right off of the polyp bud, you can cut off, you know, they kind of have these eight little arms that they're using to swim around and you can cut every arm off. It can't swim, it sinks to the bottom, but within a day it grows them all back, goes back to swimming. And that's not just an arm, those each arm contains uh, all the sensory organs of the animal. So that includes like a very simple eye, you know, a very simple statolith to orient itself. And so it's regrowing all of that relatively quickly. Um, and then as the animal gets bigger and older, it's, its abilities to do those sorts of things just seem to become increasingly diminished. So I certainly, antis my anticipation is that whatever genetic factors create potency, cell line potency in the polyp are going to decrease in the medusa. Um, but honestly, that's gonna be for future work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Aram, and thank you, David. If I may ask you a question as well, David, so given, given what you've presented today and, and other lines of research going on in your group and other groups, do, do you think it's fair enough to say that senescence in humans or mammals at large is the inevitable site product of more recently evolved lineages? That in other ways, in other words, that's the tax that we need to pay. Yeah, I mean, I... I think that is the biggest question, right? Particularly from this, so it's the biggest question, right? In aging research, it's like, is this inevitable, right? Or do you take more like David Sinclair's approach that it's essentially a disease, right? That needs to be and can be cured. Um, and to put it in that evolutionary framework that I'm taking, you know, the question is, well, so yeah, is this a, uh, the idea would be that there's sort of trade-offs, Right, that a lot of these organisms that have really impressive regenerative capabilities, these jellyfish, these sea sponges, they don't have a lot of cell types. They're physically very simple. And so perhaps becoming more complex, you know, becoming a more physically complex organism just requires this trade-off. And you have to eventually like your cells become more committed, you know, which increases the chance that they rack up mutations or DNA damage. And then eventually the whole system just falls apart after a while. And, and, and I gotta say, I, I really think, I don't know, I, I really can see it both ways right now, because again, what's exciting about this, like what is clear, I think when you take this evolutionary perspective is that aging is evolvable. So I don't, don't know whether it's inevitable, but we can clearly see when we put all these organisms in an evolutionary framework, we can see that there are organisms that can live much longer, right, than their close relatives, right? So the trait itself can be adjusted as to whether you could really stop it. Is it inevitable to our biology, perhaps, but like clearly it can be tinkered with through natural selection. And, and we see that through the different organisms, you know, the all the different model systems and the amazing animals I talked about at the beginning of this talk. So um, I really don't know. And I think that is the grand, I think that's the great question. Like, and I think that's the, that's the source of, that's the source of questions that will continue to feel a really healthy discipline that of aging research, right? Yes. I, I Absolutely. Agree. So thank you for that, David. In the interest of time, what I might do is try to bring this Q&A to, uh, to a close. If I may, David, I'll ask you to unshare your screen so that I can share mine as well, if I can remember how to do that. Okay, fantastic. So can I just confirm very quickly if you all can see my screen? Yes. Fabulous. I just, these days I have to confirm that I sometimes I carry on without knowing whether I am sure what I meant to. So. David Gold, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. I think that this presentation has, has caused a fair amount of interest. And I'm sure that the other attendees, the ones that will benefit from this presentation once we make it available through social media, will enjoy it equally as well. Going on to our next speaker, I would like to announce that our next speaker is actually around the corner. So because summer, festivities, we have decided to have our next speaker um, taking place in a week's time. So on the 7th of July at 3 p.m. UK time, we will be uh, honored by the presence of Arti Jagannath, 
who is an associate professor at the National Department for Clinical Neurosciences here at Oxford. She's an expert in circadian rhythms, and she's going to tell us all how her research relates to how to achieve and how to attain a longer lifespan, but also a longer health span. On that note, I will thank you, David, again so much for having woken up so late on California time. I will thank the rest of the audience, particularly those of you who are based here in the UK. Thank you for not giving into the temptation of looking to the commentary of the England versus Germany football match. And we will see you all at the next seminar. Thank you so much. Have thank a good day. You.